The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Hello students, uh, once more welcome to the e-learning center, distant learning center of the Minister of Secondary Education. Today we are going to have a class on lower six uh, philosophy and I am the teacher for the day. My name is Basilis Shinto. And our lesson today is an eighth lesson. And to begin with the lesson, we have to start by correcting the assignment I gave in our previous class. And in our previous lesson, I asked you to construct an, one argument to prove that the nationalistic ideological trend is an illustration of the role of African philosophy to African development since our last lesson was on African philosophy. So let's see how uh, we can use African philosophy to argue that philosophy is important for development. And this is the answer we have here. The nationalistic ideological trend of African philosophy focuses on the different ideologies and frameworks that can enhance the emergence of Africa. For instance, conscientism proposes ways to fight against colonization, capitalism, and the exploitation of man by man. Thus, it illustrates the importance of philosophy. So we understand that among the various strains of African philosophy, the most pragmatic, the one that is closer to the problem of African development is the nationalistic ideological trend, because these are the various frameworks that various African thinkers develop, and one of them is consciousness I mentioned here, to give the various ways in which Africans can follow in order to emerge and attain sustainable development. <laughs> And our eighth lesson, our lesson today is titled Ethics and Moral Frameworks. Ethics and Moral Frameworks. And before we begin with the lesson, let's look at the lesson plan or the various articulations that are going to, to ground our lesson for the day. In the first place, we shall examine the lesson ob objectives of the lesson. We'll look at previous lesson, previous knowledge that will connect us to the, to the lesson. We'll examine the problem situation. We'll look at that. We'll now engage actively into the lesson activity, and this lesson activity will culminate to the various application exercises. Uh, I'll propose some questions to test how far you have understood the lesson. And from here, we shall dive into the assignment that will give you the tasks to perform at home. Now, for the lesson objectives, this is the first thing. At the end of this lesson, you students should be able to state the definition of ethics. You should be able to differentiate between ethics and moral, because the two concepts are used interchangeably, but can we differentiate between them? You should be able, you should be also be able to evaluate the basis, the basis of moral judgment. That is, on what grounds should we refer to a particular human act as being good or bad? What are the various criteria of moral judgment? You should be able to identify the moral theories and their implicit principles. What are the various moral theories we have in the history of philosophy? And on what principle are these theories based? And you should be able to also describe the nature of the moral good. What is the nature of the moral good? Now, we are going to look at uh, the lesson, um, we'll look at the previous knowledge now. And then this is what I believe you have already that will make you to have a good grasp of the lesson of today. And I understand that at this level where we are now, you can state the rules, you can state the rules of certain social institutions like the schools and the church. We know what we call the internal rules and regulation of the schools. 
those rules constitute what we call a code of conduct, the ethics or the moral of the school. You also know the various um, rules or laws in your various churches. It can be maybe rules in the Bible, like the Ten Commandments. You know the various rules, for instance, in, in, a, in, a, in the Quran. And these rules are going to, to help you understand the lesson of the day. And now, before we proceed, let us examine the problem situation. And this problem situation is to see the importance of the lesson to you, to your life, how important it is this lesson. How can you use the lesson of today to solve the problems you encounter every day? And this is the problem situation, and I read. You are the class prefect, and most of your peers, that's your peers, your age mates, your friends, are involved in taking hard drugs, alcoholism, prostitution, and notorious indiscipline. One of the tasks you have is to present a speech on good character building as a solution to juvenile delinquency and moral decadence among your peers during the youth week. This is a this is the problem situation. And these are the questions. What will be your focus? What will be your focus? You, want, you have a task to build a character building speech for to see how to help your peers to overcome moral decadence. What will be your focus? What guiding principles shall you dwell on to drive home your message? Which discipline and what type of books will you read to build up an excellent and a morally instructive speech that will impact your peers? This is a situation. And now, you understand that from this situation, we we'll realize that uh, obviously you will have to make recourse to moral philosophy because you cannot write a speech on character building without necessarily going back to moral philosophy. And that is why the lesson of today, you see, can be very helpful or, or useful if you find yourself in situations like the one we just presented now. And now, the first articulation of our lesson today is definition. We look at the various concepts and see the meanings of these concepts and how to differentiate between them. And the first concept which comes up in our lesson, and the lesson is ethics and moral framework, is the concept of moral. What is moral? Now, etymologically, that is from the origin, moral is a concept that was used in Latin as mores, meaning customs. Ethics was used in, in Greek, ethos, and it also means custom. And now, from this definition, we understand that moral and ethics etymologically have the same meaning, they are synonymous. And that even in, their, in the practical usage, most thinkers, most philosophers, and even common people who are not in philosophy, they sometimes use ethics and moral as if they were synonyms, as if the two concepts are interchangeable. Now, but now what has to be understood is the fact that moral judgment, I, I define, that is the view of Wilfred Wanushko, and he says moral judgments appeal to standards of, the, of some kind against which action, motives, traits of character, and so, and so on are measured and assessed. Now, from this definition, we understand that moral exists in codes. The various codes here, we are making reference to the various system of rules that guide mankind, implying that every group of human beings, if they must socialize, always have a code of conduct that is let down rules that they have all agree that will guide their various activities. That is moral from the first point of view as codes of conduct. Now, secondly, uh, moral also refers to human acts, and a moral act has the following qualification. So moral does not only refer to laws that guide human action. A moral act also is also referred to as a human act. And what is a human act? A human act is characterized by three, um, um, three elements. The first characteristic of human act is that such an act should be cognitive, it should be cognitive and responsible. Now, what do we mean by cognitive? Cognitive here has to do with the mind. That is, any act that an individual before engaging into it premeditated and therefore has full knowledge of such an act, that act is, is committed after the cognitive um, aspect. Therefore, cognitive aspect implies that the person who is acting or the moral agent is well aware, is conscious and knows exactly what he's doing. Now, the second criteria of a moral act, or criteria of a moral act, is that it should be cognitive. And what is cognitive? It, it must be willed, voluntary. Any act that you engage into it 
voluntarily, wherein you are the master of your will, without any external force having influence on you, you are described as being connected in acting, and such an act is referred to as a moral act. And consequently, when when you when it is cognitive and connective, then you are unavoidably responsible for that act, which means the person who is acting is therefore accountable for it. And you understand that the opposites of moral act are what we call acts of man. And then what are acts of man? These are acts which man commits and he is not cognitive, he is not cognitive, and he's not responsible. For instance, maybe you are sleeping in the night, you have a dream, and you mistakenly kick somebody. When you kick somebody, you do not do it, you do not premeditate before acting. It's not cognitive. You do not do it voluntarily, and as such, you cannot be held responsible for such an act. Therefore, from this definition, dear students, we come to realize that moral has two um, natures. Moral refers to laws, not only to laws, laws which guide human action. Moral also refers to human act, that is, acts which can either be good or bad. That is, a moral act can be good or bad, so far as it's intentional. If you intentionally kill somebody, that is a moral act, and ethics can reflect on it. But now, on acts on man, acts on man are morally neutral because since the person is not the person did not do it knowingly, not voluntary, therefore he cannot be held responsible for that act. Acts on man do not constitute the object of reflection in ethics. Now we go now to the second concept, which is ethics. And as we said, uh, ethics comes from Greek ethos, which also means custom. However, ethics, we should not confuse ethics and moral, because ethics is more intellectual or more of a, of a science, the science of moral. And what do we mean by ethics is science of moral? It is an attempt to understand, to interpret, to some extent, guide the practice of moral. It is simply called moral philosophy, that is, that is philosophical thinking about or the analysis of pro moral problems, dilemmas, and concepts and the making of moral judgment. Let me give a simple example. The, the fourth commandment says, you should respect your parents. That is moral, that's a law. What if your parents ask you, for instance, to kill somebody? You have now to reflect whether that the, 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 the prescription of your father should be respected or not. And when you are reflecting whether you should respect that moral law or not, you are engaging into ethical reflection. So ethics is a reflection why moral refers to action or a group of laws. Now, the, the most important question in ethics then is what is the basis of our claim to right or wrong? Why moral is bivalent, that is a moral act can either be good or bad, ethics is normative. What is normative? It provides norms, laws, to differentiate the good from the bad. Ethics presents the good and the bad, Moral presents the good and the bad, but ethics comes in at a differentiation and says, this is a good. And in, in differentiating between the good and the bad, ethics also prescribes, it's prescriptive because it obliges us to seek the good and avoid the evil. And that is why ethics refers to a science of or a reflection on moral. Now, we go to the second articulation of our lesson, which is moral judgment. And moral judgment here is, what is it that makes a moral action to be considered as good? Now, this question of moral judgment, let dear students, is the center of controversy between two theories in philosophy. We have the consequentialist and we have the non-consequentialist. To the consequentialist here, it is a consequence or the end of your act that determines whether it is good or bad. But to the non-consequentialist, the consequences do not have any influence on what makes and on whether an act is good or bad. And that's why, to the question, do consequences of an act, does the consequence of an act determine its morality? To the consequentialist, the answer is affirmative. They agree that it is true that consequences make our actions be good. But to the non consequentialist, consequences do not determine the moral goodness of an act. And now we are going to look at the various consequentialism, moral consequentialism. And the first theory we are going to see is what we refer to as utilitarianism. And this is a theory defended by philosophers like Jeremy Bentham, and then we also have John Stuart Mill. Today, utility determines the morality of an act. 
And then hedonism is the most prominent form of uh, utilitarianism because to hedonism, happiness is the ultimate end, the ultimate consequence of human acts. Happiness then is the only thing of ultimate value and utility. Happiness to them is pleasure. This is how they define happiness. Pleasure in the absence of pain, that is, the, the search for pleasure and the avoidance of pain is what they define as happiness. And consequently, if your act can produce um, um, pleasure and minimize pain, then your act, or the consequence of your act is good and your act is morally acceptable. Now, Benjamin's um, utilitarianism is somewhat uh, quantitative because he focuses on um, the satisfaction of the highest number and I call the creed which accepts as a foundation of moral utility or the greatest happiness, uh, happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they turn to promote happiness. That is, it is the ability of an act to, produ to produce what? Happiness for the highest number of persons that makes an act morally acceptable. Wrong. Actions are wrong as they turn to produce the reverse of happiness, which, which is probably unhappiness or pain. Now, we also go to the second um, theory of consequentialism, which is ethical egoism. Why utilitarianism asserts that it is a satisfaction of the highest number of persons, that is a community, that makes an action to be good, egoism seeks the interest of the individual. And that's why egoism derives its name from the Latin ego from I. And it is usually contrasted with altruism from the Latin alte for the other. So egoism is the opposite of altruism. Why ego egoism seeks the happiness of the individual, altruism seeks the happiness of the other person. Egoism bases morality on self-interest and altruism bases it on the interest of the, of the other. Now, both Calicus and Trasmagus, these are the sophists. I know you're doing the sophists in Western philosophy because the moral egoists you can find them under uh, maybe sophism. They defend this theory with a lot of strength and vigor. They argue that things are only valuable to us insofar as we desire them. That is, it is because of our interests that makes something important or useful to, to us. The good life consequently consists in being successful at getting what you want. If, you re if this requires the domination of the other and the suppression of their aims in pursuit of your own, so be it, you, you go for it. Moral life consists in getting what one wants then. And then we realize that egoism is not equivalent to selfishness. All egoism says is that if I am to be giving motivating reasons to act, some those reasons have to connect with things that matter to me. That is, every justification for my act should be related to what? What matters to me? What I'm doing, does it matter to me? So if you are going to give me re arrest reasons to consider the interests of other people, those what people have to matter to me also. Which means egoism does not exclude our possibility of helping other people. We can help other people, but on the condition that those people should also matter to us. Thus, egoism is not equivalent to self-interest. Now, we have two types of egoism. We have psychological or descriptive egoism, and here, morality is based on the state of mind, wanting and desire, which is our state of mind that we always want and desire. We have rational, normative. Here, though people can be motivated by conventional opinions or from the feeling of, of the pity, that is, you can sometimes help people out of pity or out of emotions or because we have norms established in the society. To the rational ego egoist or those who defend this theory from the rational perspective, such motivations are not correct because they are not rational. What is rational is that the only reason for doing something is that you ought to do it for your own interest. That is irrational. And anything to them that departs from this train is not rational. Now we have the ethic, now we proceed to the second aspect of our reflection, which is ethical non-consequentialism. We've seen the consequential view that it is the interest that makes our action morally good. To the utilitarianist, it is the interest of the highest number of persons, and to moral egoism, it is the interest of the individual that makes the action to be good, the interest of the consequence. Now, to ethical non-consequentialism, 
Actions and the goodness of an act is not determined by the consequence or the interest that we derive from it. And we begin with the first um, theory here, which is the divine command theory. To this theory, we should always do the will of God, whatever the situation be. If we do what God commands, then we are doing the right thing. That is, doing good consists in doing the will of God, no matter the consequence. Which means the consequences here do not have any influence on our act and cannot determine whether our, our acts are morally good or bad. If we disobey God's command, then no matter what the consequence, we are not morally right. If you disobey the, 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 the God's command and, and then your action has even positive influence on people or your action produces positive consequences, those consequences do not matter. What matters is your respect of the will of God. Is your action a consequence of your respect of the will of God? If it is, then it is good. If it is not, then it is morally wrong. It is then a non-consequential moral theory. For the divine command theories, morality is independent of what any individual thinks or likes or what the society sanctions. It is not what pleases a society. It is not the consequence of your act on a society or the, on an individual that makes it good. The true standard for moral right and wrong lies in the will of God. Moral standards are the commands of God. Why should we refrain from telling lies? Why should we avoid harming other people? The answer is simple, because God has commanded us to do so. Not because maybe it is rational, not because it's going to please the other person, it is because God has commanded us to do so. And then we have the ontological ethics. This is a second uh, theory which, which also defends a non-consequential ethics, uh, ethics. Now, and this the ontological ethics, is, we call it in other words, the ethics of duty is defended by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. To Kant, when we base morality on interests or consequences, we tend to corrupt the moral will and also to create relativism. What, what does he imply by this? What he simply says is that in our moral action, we should be the master of our will. We should not allow, allow our will to be, to be influenced by any motiv, mo, uh, motivation factor, by anybody, by any influence or by any external force. Our will should be pure. Pure means it should not be influenced by anything. And therefore, he also proceeds to argue that morality is not supposed to be relative because human beings have something in them that is common. And what is common to human beings, to a can is reason. Reason is common. Therefore, if we want to make, to have morality that is universal, universal means that what is good is the same everywhere, we should then base morality on reasoning and not on those things that create differences between human beings like experience, like history, like interest or consequences. And that's why in his moral philosophy, he is in search for universality and autonomy. An interest does not make an act good, but it, but it is a type of command that our will respect that does. These universal commands, or what Emmanuel Kant calls categorical imperatives, include, we have universality, that's the first one, which says, act as if the maxim of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. That is, when you want to pose an act, you ask yourself, if this act were taken as a universal law, we mankind as a whole be comfortable with it. And when you want to act on another, it's almost the same like what you call the golden rule in church, where they say, do unto others what you want to do, that, what, what you want them to do unto you. When you want to do something, you ask yourself, if this thing was done unto, to me also, unto other people, will everybody be satisfied with such an action? If it is, then to Emmanuel Kant, it satisfies the condition of universality. Our moral duty is to do good for humanity, to him. And we also have the other one which says, the respect for the person. And here, Kant is saying that, act in such a way that you always, or I always treat humanity, never simply as a means, but always at, an, at the same time as an end. That is, this maxim or this uh, imperative commands each and every individual not to use human beings for their interests, but they should treat them as an end in themselves, as if they have intrinsic dignity that everyone ha has to respect. Now, we are done with the first problem, which was the problem of moral judgment, and we have seen the conflict between moral consequentialism and moral non 
consequentialism. We are going to the second problem, dear student, of our class today, which is the character, the problem of what the relationship between character and morality. Does character make an act morally good? Here we find that we have the virtue ethics of our research, which defends the fact that we have to base our morality on character and not on laws. Why other theories that we have seen, all of them, are based on the rules? Aristotle's virtue ethics is based on character. Other ethical theories answer the question, what should I do? And this question, what should I do, is accompanied by a series of laws and principles and rules. But to, to Aristotle, the question of virtue or the question of morality should be, what should I be? It's not what should I do that is important, it is what should I be? Modern philosophers think that the Aristotelian approach can help to avoid problems arising from more other moral theories. To Aristotle, ethics is concerned with questions like, should we be selfish or generous, a hateful or benevolent, cowardly or courageous, overindulgent or temperate? In what do these traits consist? How do they how are they cultivated and how do they figure how do they figure in a life well lived? So it is not a question of building rules, it is a question of what changing character, character building and transformation. To Aristotle, morality is character oriented rather than what rule driven morality. Why other philosophers think that there are rules? It is a respect of the various laws that make our actions morally good. To our result, it is our character that determines our, the, the morality of our action. Then, virtue determines the quality of character. And then, to him, there are two types of virtue. And virtue here refers to what the habit of doing good. That, that's how I define ethics, the habit of doing good. There are two types of ethics. We have intellectual ethics. And here, it focuses on what? Teaching and how we acquire some, some uh, moral ways of life through um, uh, teaching like wisdom. We also have moral virtue, which is acquired through what training or habits. For instance, we can learn how to be courageous. In the theory of the golden mean, for instance, Aristotle says that ethics is the midway between two extreme excess and deficiency. And here we have some 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 excesses and deficiency. Now we have, for instance, rashness is excess when there's too much courage in you. You are there's you are rash rashness. And they, when there is no courage at all, you are a coward. And to him, rather than being rash or being um, a coward, it is good simply to be uh, virtuous, and, uh, courageous. And courage here is a midway between what rashness and deficiency. We also have the the, the uh, uh, modesty. Modesty is a virtue, which is a moderation or a midway between what excess, which is shyness, and shamelessness, which is deficiency. And to him, does. Morality resides in character. And the evaluation here is simply for you to interpret this question, dear students. And these are the two questions. Do consequences make an act good? Do rules make an act morally good? And these are the interpretation I, I propose. The thesis will be that consequentialism, e.g., we have utilitarianism, egoism, eudaimonism, to them, uh, consequences make an action to be good. And to the antithesis, um, like we have the divine command theory and the, and the ethics of the American consequences do not make an act be good. To the second question, whether, whether um, the goodness of an act is based on character, the thesis with that um, the rules based on morality makes an action to be good. That is, rules make an action to be good. And on the other hand, we have the antithesis, which says that there are no rules that make an action to be good. It is simply character. We see that under a risk total. And for the assignment, dear students, you are going to define with the monism and state is ethical principles. And then for the uh, next lesson, we're going to see, we are going to work on to see the morality of abortion. Here, we shall focus on what? Finding out whether abortion is morally good or bad. Since we have seen the various ethical um, theories and principles, we shall now see how to contextualize them, apply them in the domain of abortion and see how we can use it now to reflect on the abortion to ask ourselves whether this practice should be morally accepted or not.
Tegenum, on a Tegemajang, Matagendum, Manetambia Ninja, Nanjo Bian, Ganibana, Matagemot, Ganila Kiri, Watagendum, Esakina, Bia Dinkido, Manetambia Ninja, Nanjo Bian, Tam Tama Mote, Tam Zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia niña ne injo biayen 